All righty. Good morning, everyone. I um, hope everybody can hear me okay. My name is Johnny Scott with Syngenta. I've uh, been on the MABA board for five years now. Um, I will be your moderator for this morning's sessions. Thanks to everybody uh, for participating in the MABA Great Montana Ag Rally. Um, as most of you probably know, this is a series of one-hour workshops to help our membership continue to stay informed. Um, this morning's session is sponsored by Syngenta. Um, we really thank Syngenta for their support of this rally and uh, in sponsoring sponsoring this session. Now let's uh, let's get started with session one here. Um, we will start with a message from our sponsor Syngenta of this session. Enjoy the video from Syngenta. Alrighty, thanks. Thanks again to our sponsor, Syngenta, for, for this morning's session. Uh, we'll keep it moving here, and I'll introduce uh, Dr. Janet Canodal from NDSU. Dr. Janet J. Canodal is the professor and extension entomologist at the North Dakota State University in Fargo, North Dakota. For the past 20 years, she provides statewide program leadership for the extension entomology, the North, Dakota, North Dakota IPM program, and coordinates and co-edits the NDSU Crop and Pest Report. Her extension outreach and applied research focuses on insect pests of field crops and IPM strategies, including wheat, barley, canola, soybean, pulse crops, and sunflower. She has authored or co-authored more than 300 publications in professional extension, technical, and trade journals, including over 50 peer-reviewed papers and five book chapters. Uh, thanks again, Dr. Canoto, for joining us this morning and supporting MABA. I will kick it over to you. Well, thank you very much, Johnny, for inviting me to speak to you today, or the our organization or the meeting. And also, I'd like to thank Krista and all the other organizers for putting together this informative meeting. Um, I put my email address up on the screen here, just in case you we don't have time for all the questions, you can email me and I'll get back to you. So just a general inf informative slide here about IPM scouting. Uh, when you do go out into the field, uh, make sure that you sample multiple uh, locations in the field and always walk into the field because many insects are edge insects. So they're more concentrated in the edge. 
and then you know count at least 10 plants if you're doing insect counts or 10 sweeps or more uh, if you're using the sweep net and calculate an average and for a lot of insects like foliage feeding caterpillars we do estimates of defoliation as well and there's several guides out there for defoliation um, so you can search for those on the web because many times you will overestimate it's easy to do that so i just won't repeat this every time i'm talking about scouting but know that you need to go out into the field and look at the whole field not just the field edges so i get started on the pulse crops this will include field pea lentil and chickpeas and I'll cover uh, five major insects, cutworms, grasshoppers, P. aphis, liagus bug, and P. leaf weevil. So cutworms are an early season pest and they mainly affect the seedling stage and also feed on the roots. And they belong to the insect family Noctuidae. Uh, they're also called Miller moths. As you can see from the pictures, these are large moths. They can get up to an inch and a half in the wingspans. And there's up to 28 different species that will affect our agriculture crops. So there's a lot of different species out there. Some of them overwinter here in our Northern states in the Great Plains, others migrate up into the state. So it just depends on which one um, you're talking about. Fortunately, we don't have to identify them for thresholds. We lump all the cutworms together. So, but in general, they're kind of a dull colored moth with markings on the wings. Okay, the larvae are the ones that do the injury to the crops. So these are what you're gonna be looking for out in the field. Um, as you can see, it's a very stout caterpillar. Uh, they're again kind of dull colored and they often have marking spots um, and other sort of patterns on the body. And we use that for identification as entomologists. And again, they're very tiny when they first hatch, but they get quite large when they're mature, up to two inches for some species. And I know you have quite a problem with the army cutworm. And for us in North Dakota, the dingy cutworm is a major crop pest. Just a quick overview on their life cycle. Uh, they have a complete metamorphosis. So that just means they have four life stages, egg, larvae, pupae, and adult. Uh, so if we start with the eggs in the soil, uh, they'll hatch in the spring. Some of them overwinter as eggs. And these are referred to as the later season cutworms. Other overwinter as the larvae, a small uh, partially mature larvae. And these are the ones that get going first in the spring. So these are the early season cutworms. And digi cutworm is an example of that. So they go through several molts as a larvae and eventually they'll reach the mature stage when they're quite large and about the size and diameter of a pencil. And then they go through a pupil stage, which is a resting, non-feeding stage, and they transform into the beautiful moth. And then the moth will uh, then lay, is the one that lays the eggs late summer and fall in the fields. So, and the damage is caused again by the larvae and you can see their chewing mouth parts on uh, it's how, how it'd be easy for them to chew through the young stems of the seedling and many of the cutworms are called climbing cutworms and they'll climb up and actually cause defoliation here's what some of the damage looks like in the lower figure you can see this clipped pea plant where the cutworm climbed up and clipped it. So that plant will die. You won't get anything from that. Cutworms are active at night. So when you're out there scouting, you're not going to see them. They're only feeding at night. Occasionally you may see them on a very cloudy day. 
but they'll chew on those plants either be above or below ground. It depends on the moisture. When it's moist, they wear often feed above ground. When it's very dry, they need the moisture, so they'll feed below the ground. And they do feed on the foliage, as I mentioned, but most often what farmers notice is bare spots out in the field and it'll go right down the row. That's cutworm. So you need to um, you know, dig up those plants and look in the soil for the larvae that are feeding. And of course, uh, they reduce the plant stand and this will increase your weed problems and also lower the yield. Okay, for scouting, since they're most active in the spring, it's very important to get out early and that's when the crop is most susceptible in the seedling stage. Once it gets uh, larger, the stem gets thicker and it hardens off. So it's much harder for the cutworm to cut it. So it's mainly the sp spring, May through June. So remember we do have those late season cutworms and look for those clip plants and that's where you're gonna most likely find a live cutworm down in the soil during the day. In the spring, they may get going early on those hilltops or south facing slopes. Those are the areas that warm up first. So the cutworms may be concentrated in those types of areas. When you disturb them, it's, cutworms often curl up into a little ball or they'll try to hide in any debris out in the field. So the threshold uh, for the, all the pulse crops is the same. Uh, two or more cutworms per square yard. And you want to control them if they're at threshold when they're small. They're much easier to kill. Once they get mature, like the ones you see in the redback cutworm, this is a late season cutworm, then uh, it's too late. They're done feeding. So it's very important to be on top of cutworms. Um, otherwise, you're not going to get good control with any insecticide. These guys here are done feeding and they're about ready to pupate and then transform into the adult moth. So there's a lot of different chemicals out there for control. A lot of people use insecticide seed treatments on their pulse crops, but we generally don't recommend that for cutworms. You do not get very good control. You'll be lucky if you get 50% or less with the insecticide seed treatment. Uh, it's just not a strong enough chemical. Uh, so we usually recommend if you know you have a field where you've had cutworm problems in the past um, and you've had it for several years in that field, there might be something attractive to the moths for egg laying. So then use a in soil insecticide at plant, um, like you see here, the T-band system or a foliar insecticide applied in the evening because that's when they're actively feeding. And a foliar insecticide would be a broadcast application. Here's just a diagram of the uh, T-band uh, application. Again, the idea behind it is you're just providing a zone of protection around the seed. So when the, the caterpillar or cutworm comes into that, he'll end up dying. And Mustang Max is registered uh, on the pulse crops for T-band application, and there's many other that are registered. So moving on to grasshoppers, uh, there's many different species of grasshoppers as well. Um, there's probably about 50 that will feed on our crops, but these are the top three that we usually see. Uh, the red-legged grasshopper and the two-striped are the most common in North Dakota. And I know you have them as well. Uh, for the life cycle, it's simple or incomplete development or metamorphosis. So that means we just have three uh, life stages, eggs, the nymph or immature and the adult. So if we start with the egg, they're laid in the soil and they'll hatch in about two weeks in the spring. 
And then the nymph goes through several molts, five to six molts. And as you can see, they're smaller than the adult and they don't have wings, but they do have wings pads, which you can see in the picture there. And that takes about four to seven weeks. And then you'll get the adult, which does have wings and they're very mobile and they can fly long distances to find the fields that they like. And this type of development is similar to um, in aphids and plant bugs, which we'll also be talking about. Okay, here's the times to get out and look for the grasshoppers, just like the cutworms. We wanna look for those nymphs early on to see if they're at high levels because they're easier to control when they're in the dim stage than the adult stage. So scout early, the eggs are typically laid in field digits ditches where there's lots of grass. They do like sandy soils too. Um, so they're pretty easy to scout um, in the edges. And then in the late summer into August, um, you look for the adults and they're very mobile. They can move in and out of fields. So you gotta be on top of those adults. Uh, typically after the small grains are harvested, like your wheat, winter wheat, that's when these grasshoppers will start to move into the pulse crops. And then in the fall, uh, they do lay eggs as pods. I don't know if you can see that on the root there on the lower right picture, but um, you can look for egg laying sites because that's uh, an easy way to know where they're gonna be occurring next spring. And again, we can have grasshopper outbreaks that usually take several years of dry, wet, droughty weather. We, in the IPM's uh, crop survey we have in North Dakota, we survey for grasshoppers in the field ditches. And you can see we've had increasing populations the last two years, um, mainly in the central and eastern part of the state. And this is kind of abnormal. Normally we have higher populations out west. So here's the threshold for grasshoppers. Um, lentils, very susceptible to grasshoppers compared to field pea and chickpeas. Threshold is very low. And usually it's always adults at the time of year when they move into the pulse crops. So it's only two per square yard. So watch those lentils. What happens is they clip off the whole pod. So that ends up falling just like flax. Um, and then field pea and chickpea, as you can see, I put the thresholds for both nymphs and adults per square yard. And it varies depending on whether it's margin or field the threshold is much lower in the field than the margin. But for adults, it would be eight to 14 adults per square yard. You might be saying, oh, I can't count that 50 to 75 for the nymphs per square yard in the margin. Um, I can't count that many and yeah, that's really hard to do. So what we use, entomologists just love tools, we use sweep nets and four 180 degree sweeps down in the canopy is equal to a square yard. And usually I recommend taking at least 20 sweeps and then dividing by five to calcul calculate your average. Okay, P aphids is uh, very small. Uh, they're green, so they kind of blend in with the plant and they're on the undersides of the leaves, but in heavy infestations, as you can see in the figure on the right, they'll get on the stems, the pods, um, so you can find them anywhere. Uh, they're about eighth of an inch long. Um, they have tailpipes. That's how you can identify it's an aphid. Um, on the back end, the entomologists call them cornicles. And the nymphs look just like the adults, except they're a little bit smaller and don't have wings. The adults can be winged or wingless, depending on if they're migrating or moving around from field to field, they'll have wings. 
they are very uh, bad for the crop. They feed on the plant sap. You'll end up with wilted, stunted plant leaves. They excrete honeydew. So sometimes you may notice the plants um, are shiny or sticky. That's the honeydew that they excrete from feeding on those plant saps with all those proteins. They need to excrete that. But the main problem is that they vector viruses and these viruses are very deadly. So when they do this using their piercing sucking mouth parts. Uh, it goes right down into the plant tissue in the phloem. And when they're feeding, they can take up viruses during that process. And then that's how they transmit them to other plants when they're out there feeding. And they have a unique feeding uh, mechanism that's called sap feeding. So they land on a plant. They don't know if it's a host or not until they taste it. So they have to feed on it and they come into contact with many different plant species throughout this process and many viruses. So it's kind of like you going to the grocery store saying you want bananas. Well, you'd have to taste the apples and um, everything else until you find your bananas. Then you know it's a host plant and that's where you'll lay your eggs. So that's how come the viruses get transmitted so easily is this feeding mechanism. So it's they're like um, dirty hypodermic needles, aphids flying around. They're carrying all these different viruses, but once they find their host, if they have one of the viruses of the pulse crop, like the peed seed borne mosaic virus, it can cause significant yield loss. So we need to be very proactive and not wait until we see these viruses symptoms because we don't know if the aphids have it or not. And we do have a publication available on the PC born mosaic virus and field pea and lentils if you're interested in more information. And I'll provide the uh, Krista with all the links to these publications for you. Uh, P aphid, for the thresholds, um, first you need to go out and start scouting. It's most susceptible during flowering. So you wanna get out there 50 to 75% flowering stage and then all the way through pod development. Um, and P aphids, it's two to three aphids per eight inch plant tip. Or if you have a sweet net, uh, you can sweep and it's nine to 12 aphids per sweep. And of course you wanna take probably up to hundred sweeps. And it is difficult as you know, to sweep field peas. Uh, lentils, the threshold is a little higher, 30 to 40 aphids per sweep. And chickpea, there's no threshold that has been developed. They typically don't get too many aphids. And again, if you, have sent off some plants to the diagnostic lab and they confirm that you have viruses, you need to be very aggressive on controlling the aphids out there. IPM of the aphids, they overwinter in legumes and alfalfa, but we also get a lot of migrants that come into the North Dakota and Montana. They can go hundreds of miles in the upper wind trajectories. So be aware of some of the wind patterns and which way they're blowing. They're going to be bringing in aphids, cutworms, and other pests. And again, flowering to early pot is the most susceptible stage where it's going to have yield impact. Control early seeding is good because a lot of times we get the migrants later in the season. So it'll be late June, July. Um, so if that crop is up and growing early, it's gonna have a better chance. And get those host plant resistant varieties for those viruses. There's many becoming available now. And then foliar insecticides are available uh, for chemical control. There are some that are more friendly now to the beneficial insects, some of the newer modes of action. And there is many natural controls for aphid. There's fungal diseases 
And when we have the right uh, moist, high humidity, some rain, frequent rainfalls, we can see a lot of fungal outbreaks um, on the aphids. And you can see the little white uh, growth from the fungal uh, disease in the pictures. And these aphids are not alive, they're dead. And then heavy rains and thunderstorms are your friend. When these, these happen, they can wash the aphids right off the plant, especially younger plants that don't have a heavy canopy yet. And then they drowned. So we can actually get good control with some of our thunderstorms that come through the prairies. Then there's many predators. I'm just showing the most common one, the ladybird beetles. Everyone recognizes those uh, adults. They can eat up to 300 aphids per day, but recognize the larval stage as well. That's a little alligator you see down there. They're very voracious too, and they'll eat 200 to 300 aphids per day as well. And then <clears throat> a lot of folks think the pupal stage is a pest because it attached to the leaves and the stems and the pods, but this is just the transformation stage where it's going to emerge as a adult beetle. So um, it's not causing any damage to the plant. Parasitic wasps, they lay their eggs right into the body of the aphid and they eat it out from the inside out. And then they emerge, you can see the hole in the left side picture. That's where the aphid parasitoid wasps uh, emerge and we call these little empty shells of the aphids after the parasite leaves mummies. You can actually see these when you're out scouting. Haligus bug, it's mainly a problem just on field pea and lentil. Uh, it's again a small insect, only a quarter of an inch and it's very fast moving. So it is kind of difficult to see out there in the crops because they move around, they see you coming and they hide. Uh, but you can use this triangle on the back as an identification for this group of ligus bug or plant bugs. The names kind of use um, either way. And the color can vary. Some of them are pale green and others are darker uh, reddish brown. And the immatures look just like the adult, but again, they don't have wings. Some people think they look like aphids, but remember aphids have those tailpipes or cornicles. They overwinter in alfalfa and tree rows and they attack a lot of different crops, uh, 385 crops in weed species. Okay, and they uh, most often in alfalfa, they're a pest in alfalfa, um, or you can find them in CRP. Uh, they get into canola and sunflower as well as pulse crops, but we usually don't see them moving over into these other crops until the alfalfa is hayed. And there's a direct correlation. They're moving off because the oftentimes these crops are flowering and attractive to the plant bugs or ligus bugs. And then they'll lay eggs. They also have piercing sucking mouth parts, just like our aphids. And they, both the nymph and adult will feed on the plants and they inject a toxic salva into the plant or that developing seed, which cause it to become deformed. And they're most present during hot, dry weather. And we call the damage from plant bugs or ligus bug chalk spot. It's kind of a pitted depression and you will get downgraded to a lower grade when you take them in and they deteriorate in storage faster and you reduce germination if you're gonna use it for seed. And both the adult and nymph, as I mentioned, will cause this type of damage. And it's easy to confuse this type of damage with mechanical damage during harvest. So you gotta, you know, be aware if ligus bugs were out in the field. So for scouting, you wanna go out with your sweet net and they're most um, active during the sunny part of the day. So it's best to go in the afternoon when it's warm and sunny. And then use your sweet net, get that down into the canopy 
so you can get the insects captured. And the threshold for both uh, filpy and lentils is seven to 10 migus bugs for 25, 25 sweeps. And usually I've did, done some research on this in field peas and lentils. And I always, I looked at timing during crop stages, but I found one spray during late flowering to early pod usually was adequate to prevent yield loss. Pea leaf weevil is a new insect that we have mainly on field peas and fava beans here in North Dakota. Um, it's moving its way eastward from Montana. So we do uh, have this now in the western part of the state. The, it's a weevil, so it does have a short snout. Um, it's not real big, it's 3 16th of an inch long. And you can identify it by the three stripes on the thorax that you can see in the top picture. Uh, the larvae is uh, small and you're most likely not gonna see this unless you dissect some of the nodules. Uh, they're feeding inside those nodules, they're C-shaped, and when it's more mature, it will have a dark brown head. This is the early instar larvae that you see in the lower right picture. Okay, for the life cycle, they overwinter in alfalfa and trees as adults, and then they'll emerge um, as soon as you get your field peas seeded and they're emerging out of the soil, they'll be there uh, laying eggs. And it's typically in June. Um, and then they'll go through the larval stage, which feed on the root nodules and then pupate. And then you'll get another generation later in the year, usually August, September. It's usually during harvest. And that's when you'll see the um, new adults. They don't do much damage then to the crop. Obviously it's, it's being harvested, but any late planted fields may get some feeding from the adult. They typically move into alfalfa then. They do not complete their life cycle though on alfalfa, but they will feed on it. So the adult, creates these characteristic feeding notches on the leaves. And usually it's next, you know, closest to the pasture or last year's fields um, or areas where the, the weevil overwintered. Uh, you can get climbing cutworms that will cause something similar to this. So try to find the adult weevil when you're out there scouting, if you do see this, just to confirm it's not cutworm feeding. Uh, the larvae will chew and tunnel right into that nitrogen fixing nodule, the one in the lower picture we excised from the nodule that you see there. And this does reduce nitrogen fixation by the plant, causes poor plant growth and lower uh, seed yields. For scouting, you want to walk two transects, one near the field and one more on the interior of the field and look for the notching. And then calculate an average percent of the plants that have a notching on it. So the threshold is only for foliar insecticides. Uh, and if you're seeing 30% of the seedlings damaged with notching, that would be considered uh, action threshold where you need to apply a foliar insecticide. Unfortunately, the foliar insecticides, they do not target the larvae that do all the damage to the plant, but only the adults. So we're trying to prevent egg laying from the adults, uh, but it's not as effective as insecticide C treatments for control of pea leaf weevil. And that's because the adults have a wide emergence window, May, June, and even into part of July. Um, so insecticide seed treatments do a better job of reducing the notching from the adults and the larval feeding on the nodules and you get better protection from yields. So our growers in North Dakota have switched to using neonicotinoid insecticide seed treatments and they've they're pretty happy now with the results or 
just you're not getting very good control foliar. For culture control, the Canadians have done quite a bit of research on pea leaf weevil and they found reduced tillage has lower populations of pea leaf weevil. So that's good because that's what we use primarily out in the western part of the state. And seeding later is better for for you, not the leaf weevil. So um, let your neighbor go ahead and get seeded first um, and they'll attract more of the pea leaf weevils. Uh, they have been using trap crop or fava beans as, as a preferred crop over even field peas for pea leaf weevil. And they're doing some experimentations to see how effective it would be to use as a trap crop on the edge. There is a publication we have out on pea leaf weevil and also a diagnostic series on pulse crop insects. Um, so and I'll provide the links for you. The diagnostic series um, has, it's a real hard, you can run over it with your tractor, it's get it wet, it's kind of plat like plastic coated paper. And here's some of our pulse crop production guides that are also avail available that cover everything from agronomy, weed control, disease control, as well as insect control. So you might want to also take a look at these publications. I'm going to going to talk about canola, the major insect pests, the flea beetles, crucifer and striped flea beetles are the two species. And then there's a new and emerging insect pest. You may not have heard of this yet. The canola flower midge, Contenaria brassicoli. It's up in Canada and we just found it this, year, this last year, 2020, in uh, our, our canola in North Dakota. So for flea beetles, they overwinter as an adult, and then the eggs uh, in May, then the larvae feed on the secondary root hairs, and then pupal stage. And then you get a, a summer generation and the flea beetles that will feed on the pods, but they generally do not cause economic yield loss. Okay, so the damage from flea beetles is chewing. They have chewing mouth parts and they cause pitting in the leaves and defoliation. <clears throat> so you can see in the top picture, there was no insecticide seed treatment and the defoliation was fairly heavy. Um, on the bottom picture, there was an insecticide seed treatment as, which was providing excellent control and there's hardly any uh, damage. So we rely on insecticide seed treatments for a major control of um, flea beetles, mainly the neonicotinoid group, thiamethoxin, clothianidid, imidacloprid. There is a new group um, the, of neonicotinoid group 4D that just came out and was registered in canola, the Buteo start. And then we also have the diamines, chlorantronilapril, fertenza, lumiderm group 28 mode of action. So and here's some information from Bayer um, and they'll have Buteo Sart available this year in DeKalb and Asgro seed. It's systemic and the insecticide is translocated to the edge of the leaves. And the Prosper Everglow and Buteo is the red bar and Prosper Everglow is the um, green bar and the untreated is the gray bar and you can see it did a better job than the uh, just the prosper Everglow alone so it looks like they're going to be tank mixing it with uh, some of the other uh, neonicotinoids for foliar thresholds um, you need to use uh, the 20 to 25 percent defoliation and this is the threshold you use to determine if you need to apply a foliar insecticide for control of flea beetles. As you know, a lot of times uh, the seed will just sit in the ground. Maybe it got cold and then it gets wet. Um, so we don't get all the time good uptake of the systemic insecticides. So the residual might not be what you expected. 
So you may need to follow up that seed treatment with a foliar insecticide on top of it. So you can monitor for flea beetles using sticky traps. There's no threshold though. Um, and there's also a research pheromone that is available for the striped and the Christopher flea beetle. And we found that early planted canola had more damage than late planted canola. And that's, uh, however, we need to consider the agronomic factors and we like to plant canola early because we usually see higher yields because otherwise, you know, it's, you know, flowering during the heat if you plant later and you end up getting poor yields as a result. Uh, No-till systems reduce flea beetles. They like a cooler environment. And even if you use insecticide seed treatment, it's not uncommon to see 10 to 20% yield loss if you have heavy flea beetle populations. So we've been using our neonicotinoids insecticide seed treatments for a long time, over 18 years, and we are concerned about insecticide resistance, uh, especially when we use one class of insecticide year after year against the pests that's very common and abundant. So in Tansy documented that there is resistance in the crucifer flea beetles, mainly Phyllotrita striolata, which is the striped flea beetle. Um, but the crucifer flea beetle was still getting fairly good control. So they postulated we may see a shift from crucifer flea beetle to striped flea beetles in the future. So we tested this in North Dakota. We looked at uh, Helix. Uh, Prosper Everglow, and then the new mode of action, 28 Lumiderm. And we saw um, these three different sites, Dickinson, Minot, and Langdon. And we got good control of our crucifer flea beetles um, compared to the untreated check, except at Minot, we started to see some reduced um, mortality. Uh, in general, we see saw about 70 to 80 percent mortality, and the data was similar each year. year. We, we've done this for several years, and we're going to be repeating this one more year. And then for the feeding injury, however, we did get uh, fairly good control, as you can see with all the insecticide seed treatments. And this was similar both years. For the crucifer flea beetle versus the striped flea beetle, you can see the striped flea beetle um, had significantly lower mortality. In fact, it was the same as the untreated check. That's the orange bar. The crucifer flea beetle in the blue had the 80% mortality with the insecticide seed treatments. Uh, feeding injury was much higher um, in the striped flea beetles compared to the crucifer flea beetle. So the crucifer flea beetle, we're still getting fairly good control uh, with the insecticide seed treatments that we tested. In the striped flea beetles, however, we are starting to see tolerance of the and possibly resistance with these insecticide seed treatments. So that's not good news, but fortunately, most of the flea beetles are crucifer flea beetles in North Dakota and Montana. The striped flea beetle is more up in Alberta and Saskatchewan. So this is a new species of midge that's being observed in canola. Uh, midges belong to the family Cedomyidae, and most of you are familiar with um, wheat midge. It's in the same family. This is called the canola flower midge. It was just recently identified in 2017 as Contenaria brassicolae. They originally thought this was Swede midge, but it turned out to be a different species. It's only been found so far on canola, but we assume there may be other hosts. So the damage is caused from the larvae. They injure the pods or the flowers and it swells into a gall which remains closed. In image B at the point of those arrows you can see a very tiny larvae. 
And these seed pods here are all injured by the canola flower gall midge. And typically what you will see is a elongated bottle shape closed flower gall. So look for these to see if you have it. Uh, this is a good way to identify the canola flower midge. The adult is very difficult to see. You probably won't find it unless you're trapping for it. Uh, but the larvae and the damage to the pods are easier to see. You can see all those black dots up there where they found it up in Canada, and it is in Manitoba now too. Um, and then we got a hold of the research pheromone. It's not commercially available, but I obtained it from Dr. Mori up in Canada. And you can see we found it in six of the 10 trap sites and five of the northern counties. So it is present in North Dakota as well, which we weren't happy about. Um, <clears throat> we're gonna continue trapping for the adults to see if it's more widespread. Some of the research up in Canada found late planted canola had reduced midge infestations. Uh, they tested insecticide seed treatments, but they found little or no impact on the midge injury to pods, which makes sense. Our insecticide seed treatments are only effective 28 days and the midge is emerging four to six weeks after planting. So it's, it's uh, the residual is gone. So we don't know what the economic impact is on yield of canola yet, but there's studies underway up in Canada where they have higher pressures uh, we haven't seen, you know, we just detected this, so we haven't seen any yield loss yet here in North Dakota either. So we'll keep our eyes on it. So there's several publications that we have available for you if you're interested in more detail and a field production guide. Uh, for flax, I just wanted to uh, have one slide because I'm running long. And this grasshoppers is our number one pest. And the reason why is these adult grasshoppers will clip bowls prior to harvest and they'll just, you'll find them on the ground. There's very few insecticides registered as foliar applications for control. Uh, there's two, Mustang Max, a pyrethroid, and seven are carbamate. And if you use in seven, uh, make sure you buffer buffer it if you have high pH. It's very sensitive to high pH and it will inactivate the insecticide. So, and seven also is slower acting. So if you have bowls that are ending up on the ground, I would recommend using Mustang Max over seven because you get a quicker kill. Uh, cutworms are also a major problem. Uh, you have both the army cutworm and pale western cutworm in Montana. The threshold is seven to 10 cutworms per square yard. And they can easily cause a 10% yield loss. So if you're wondering, well, what are all the pesticides registered on these crops? You can look at my North Dakota Field Crop Insect Management Guide. Uh, we also have one for fungicides and herbicides as well. You can download the PDF. It's, it's fairly large, over 100 pages. Um, or you can get it on our NDSU Extension Management app. There's also a photo library on some of the past efficacy tables. And if you don't know what an insect is, you can submit your photo on this app and you'll it'll come, insects come directly to me. So and you can find this both at uh, Apple and other type of smartphones. So and also sign up for our crop and pest report. Um, it comes out weekly during the summer. We get going in May through um, September. And we'll have pest alerts in there, new pesticide information, weather and other things that might be pertinent to Montana as well. And that's all I had. I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'll try to answer any questions if they're time or you can um, email me. 
All righty. Well, thank you, Dr. Canodal. Um, we've got about six minutes for some questions. We, I just had one come in, Dr. Canodal. Um, do any of the foliar insecticides, such as the pyrethroids, provide any residual for cut room, cutworm, even if it's just a day or two? Yes. Um, yes, um, we primarily do use our pyrethroids for control of cutworms. And I've done some trials on rates, and I found that the, you know, if you use the low end of a labeled rate, um, you're going to get maybe three to five days. But if you use the high end of the label rate, I know that costs more, but I saw up to seven to 10 days, uh, depending again on which pyrethroid. I was testing bathroid, I believe. And uh, so, yeah, there is uh, a benefit there. You know, the higher end of the rates last longer. And then also you got to take into account the weather. Uh, when pyrethroids degrade quickly when it's very hot and 90 and above. So, you know, do your applications in the evening when it's cooler so you get that good knockdown with the pyrethroids. Okay, well, well thank you for that one. Um, let's, let's, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about grasshoppers. Um, we had probably the worst grasshopper year that I've ever seen. Last okay. Year, and they are predicting that it won't get much better. Um, is, what's our best practices there to uh, to make sure we're we're getting a handle on grasshoppers, um, in particular to seed treatments? I know it provides some some help. Yeah. Um, as far as treatments go, what uh, what are options there? Yes. Um. <clears throat> the problem, I guess, I recommend foliar insecticides over insecticide seed treatments. The insecticide seed treatments do provide control of the young nymphs as they start to move into the field though. So if you have real high pressures, it's very important to get out early because they're easier to kill in the nymph stage, immature stage, over the adult stage. So it's important if you're going to have an outbreak year to be proactive and control the NIM stage grasshoppers if they're at threshold. And I know in North Dakota, we're also in a drought uh, for so far this winter. We don't have as much snow and we were dry last fall, which is good for egg laying of grasshoppers. So if we continue to be dry, I think we're gonna have grasshopper problems here too. And also the highway department gets involved if we we have outbreaks and they actually start the counties, they'll start spraying the ditches for the NEMS. You, you know, you don't like to see the insecticides going out. There's pollinators and other natural enemies in those ditches. So they do provide some service. So you hate to see that happening. But when we get to outbreaks, sometimes, you know, we do need to spray the ditches. All right. Thank you. And also, I was going to mention, too, uh, if you do have to spray a flowering crop, there's many pollinators in our crops. I did a pollinator survey in soybeans, soybeans, which I wasn't expecting very many bees out there. Well, we found 115 species of bees. I was expected maybe 20, 30, but we monitored with bull traps throughout the flowering and um, it was just amazing. So there, I think there's a lot more pollinators in our crops than we think, even if they're not needed for yield uh, production, <clears throat> they are doing some benefit out there. So if you have to spray, I would recommend spraying in the evening when the bees are back at their hives um, or early morning but in visiting with beekeepers, they prefer the evening. It gives a little more time for that insecticide to dry before they get active next um, in the morning. So just be aware of uh, the good insects out there that feed on the pollen and the nectar in those flowers, especially field bees. And... Alrighty. <clears throat> 
Well, thanks again, Dr. Kenoda, for joining us this morning. That was, that was super yeah. informative. We really appreciate your time. Yeah, um, thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Thank you. And to everybody else, we hope uh, we hope you found this uh, this session informative. Uh, thanks again to Syngenta and Dr. Janet Kenoda for uh, for supporting for their support of MABA. The next session will begin at 1030 today. That's a half hour from now. And we'll be talking about persistent and emerging diseases of Montana pulse crops with Dr. Uta McKelvey from uh, Montana State Extension. Um, that session will be sponsored by our friends over at BASF. Um, again, if you're not registered for that one, uh, go to mtagbiz.org. That's mtagbiz.org and get registered for that one. And uh, we will see you back here in about half an hour. Um, thank you, and we'll, we'll see you in a bit.